this this started out as a um, an attempt to think about morality in in the context of the the, the uh, ethnography that I'm familiar with on egalitarian hunter gatherers, uh, and the reason I'm, I'm thinking about morality is uh, that in September. Camilla and I have organised uh, an ASA panel on uh, laughter, bodies and the evolution of morality. So it's kind of in the air. Um, but it was also a really good opportunity to go back and look at the, the politics of Eros paper uh, because it, it was writ written a long time ago as part of my thesis and uh, once it was published it kind of just went off and I, I moved on to other things but I have been realising that really what the politics of Eros is talking about is um, another kind of moral community that uh, is coming from within the, the collective body as opposed to being op imposed upon it. Um, and so this is really a, a work in progress. It's an attempt to start to bring in some of the interest in how uh, that moral community is established and shared with the work specifically on women's coalitions. Um, and I'd like to talk a wee bit about the, the politics of Eros paper again, just to reiterate the, the main points there, and then move on to um, talking more about uh, these two substances in the Embengele and <coughs> Juntua world that are Ekila and Nom. They're two polysemic terms uh, that refer to a whole corpus of physical and cultural and cosmological elements. Um, but they're both very strongly located in the body and specifically in the kind of solar plexus area of the body. So, um, so, my paper's just vanished off the screen. <laughs> Chris, have you any ideas as to your your thing? Your your magnifying <laughs> facility is just coming up. It's gone slow today. Oh, that's happening. Um, well, obviously, I'm trying pressing that damn thing. Oh, there we are. There we are. Okay. So I, um, I'm going to start by asking what connects cognitive and emotional intelligence. Um, because there's a there's a, a an in between there that isn't often discussed. Um, we know all about cognitive intelligence. It's kind of it's a big a big um, point of discussion uh, at the moment, and we're hearing a little bit more about emotional intelligence. But I I want to begin to open up the idea of a physical morality um, that sits between the cognitive and emotional and, and kind of is, is the foundation for everything else. Um, um, and I want to ask what drives the extraordinary human interest in sharing and caring, as Sarah Hardy phrases it, um, using the Mbengele and Juntua terms, Ekila and Nom, respectively, um, I'm going to propose that morality is fundamentally a corporeal element. It has to be viscerally experienced in order to remain live. Um, I, I want to suggest that morality, therefore, is intrinsically revolutionary. This means that in order to survive, moral systems have to remain in flux. They have to remain in motion. The moment they settle, taken either the shape of divine right or of the secular state, they tend to assume a fixed quality with, you know, you find walls and laws and this punitive social and, and later emotional economy. So moral systems that get static tend to become inherently anti-social, ironically, uh, and anti-freedom. The primary function being to privatize and administer power as opposed to diffuse power out through the community. Ekila and Nom are something else. They're physical accountability, physical responsibility. You're not talking here about obedience 
you're not talking about an imposed moral accountability. This is organic, homegrown, localised accountability because it's rooted in the body of each individual within the community from birth onwards. Um, so before going any further, I want to look at the theory of social contract as developed by Thomas Hobbes because um, Hobbes was a very important thinker in developing this idea of the possibilities as either a fundamentally violent and miserable primitive society with man pitted against man or the sophisticated state societies where you have these, these rational self-interested individuals who will agree to surrender their independence and the interests of peace and security um, and by mutual consent appoint a kind of supreme ruler. The ruler would guarantee their collective defence and their personal security and in return they'd obey his laws and give him complete obedience. So this is essentially a morally justified agreement made among individuals that brings formal society into existence. And it's important because it's often used to demonstrate the value of government and the grounds for political dominion, uh, obligation and authority in the move away from the insecurity of the stateless society citizens are apparently ag agreeing to respect and obey a new state order in exchange for stability and security. This st stability and security that Hobbes argued only a system of political rule could provide. So the, con the social contract theories of Hobbes and Locke start from the concept of man in a primitive state without political authority or formal checks on the behaviour of individuals. Going beyond that, um, into a developed social and political life guided by a principle of natural law. A natural law theory held that there were immutable principles of law that existed as part of the natural world that would define what's right, just and good for man. These principles were discoverable by the use of reason um, and all people were subject to their laws. Uh, and I'm very interested in this kind of rational paternity authority figure that appears almost on cue anywhere that we're talking about political agency, power, structure or security. To my eye this figure is essentially one face of the good cop, bad cop, split personality of the alpha male. It's the other side of a form of submission to authority, what I think of as the, the control and command mentality. Against it, we have something else entirely. This collective self that we were discussing this morning in the, in the Viva, which is absolutely fizzing with its continual movement, its, uh, the, the, the continual movement of its constituent parts, and which balks at any whiff of uh, obedience. Um, the kind of self that Bakhtin was writing about so beautifully in Bakhtin in his world, in Rabelais and his world. So there are two big assumptions here which have travelled a long way, uh, deep into the recesses of modern political theory, as well as into areas of political organisation and society. And the first is that human communities without any discernible hierarchy, no government, no leaders, no bosses, are inherently unstable and threatening to their members members, at best simple and at worst destructive. The second big assumption is that state society, that kind of self-protective contract whereby we relinquish personal power to government in exchange for security is a good thing. So hunter-gatherers and social sexual egalitarianism tends to, to equal simple, undeveloped, potentially threatening uh, the, the life that Hobbes described as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. And, and I know that that's uh, something of a cliche, but um, I'm talking about two kind of models for the way in which people are able to organise and experience power. Um, I'd like to develop another kind of picture, another kind of moral collective. And it's a picture that has extended out of the, the article on the politics of Eros. Uh, and this picture takes the idea of a ritually collectivized body, in this case the collective female body, as the origin of other moral inclinations and observances. Um, 
before getting to what Nam and Akila have to do with this other kind of moral community, I want to digress to that paper because I think it's relevant uh, as the other side of Hobbes' primitive man with his need for delegated power in the patern paternal state. Um, and I was proposing in that article that by examining the language of the body in Yaka or Mbuti, uh, Mbengele ritual dialogue, we could start to develop an alternative understanding of the person, one in which uh, biology and sex were not inherently problematic because the move to deconstruct the body is based on that assumption and could in, in fact be a source of great cultural power and also an, an organizing force. Um, the elaboration, the performative nature of sex, I was arguing in that paper, is an expansion rather than construction. So you, you have this deprivatizing of the body uh, uh, and its ability to move out into cultural fields and shape uh, a, a power pendulum that's moving constantly in the society. The stress was, throughout that article, was on the discursive potential of the collective body. And I was using the term, the politics of Eros, to refer to a whole kind of creative ritual complex that stresses the power of sex, procreation, laughter, dance, this world of blood and breath over the possibility of hierarchy and closure. Uh, so biology was uh, always becoming cultural. Uh, and gender was what coalesced in the ritual tension between the sexes, what uh, Victor Turner described as a play of forces working out continually. Going back to the politics of Eros after a long time, there's this sense of the injection and contraction of power through that paper. This oscillation between the sexes and between individual desire and group equilibrium. Um, and I argued that in order to produce that piston-like motion, poles were required. But uh, using Bakhtin's uh, writing on the, the, the collective body and the culture of laughter, uh, it was not the individual uh, life of the body. It, was the, it wasn't, the, as he says, the drama of an individual body or a private material way of life. It was the great generic body of the people. And that point's crucial in thinking through the move from sex to gender. So we weren't talking about a private biological body severed by a long history of uh, political religious repression from its own language. Um, and Jackson had backed that up uh, by, by, with his work on the power of dance and music in uh, ritual dialogue, noting that the, the movement and music and, and dance of uh, collective ritual bodies were what promoted a sense of levity and openness both in body and mind, which verbal and cognitive forms, he says, ordinarily inhibit. Um, so there was in that paper uh, a, a strong interest in the kind of transformative effects of dance uh, on community politics and the way in which uh, people like the Mbengele or um, the, the Mbuti or the Yaka or, or the Juntua um, are using these kind of transcendent moments, these these um, this this really f heightened emotional state and feel good uh, element to to manage political fields uh, in a way that is quite extraordinary because whenever you have the entire community involved in these big back and forth dialogues, uh, you, you, you there's there's no longer any need for the big boss. You have people containing and acting out power continually. Um, so dance has a defining quality here. And, and I argued that these and other Mokondi Masana, um, like Ngoku, uh, Ejengi, weren't additional to political life in the absence of hierarchy, but were central egalitarian forces. Um, I should have said really that in that paper one of the the central part of it was bringing out what women are doing in their collective public dances and this very graphic ribald language that's used uh, during women's dances where they'll clear the camp 
and storm through um, ostensibly beautified and um, attractive and, and doing these very sensual dances but at the same time completely inviolable marked off as inviolable um, and, and able to capitalize on that to really you know, uh, bring home their their temporary ritual authority um, and I had begun with the attempt to describe an alternative kind of body politics and the with the idea of non-coercive power uh, a power defined as being for relationship self-possession joy social equilibrium and connected it to the to these big collective dances um, using the term in that paper the politics of eros was part of an attempt to stay faithful to this culture of the body that draws in the bigger rituals and the the pendulum between male and female ritual coalitions um, and then that low-level buzz of song and dance and motion that's kept going in any community um, and the, 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 the constant focus on the interchange between the sexes um, and, and I think that that issue of sexual tension that Colin Turnbull brought out so well in his writing on uh, the Mbuti is really uh, the elephant in the room in, in gender studies uh, uh, and often in the social sciences generally it's it's something that uh, uh, we tend not to discuss as much uh, in, in its cultural form. Uh, once things move into culture, we talk about gender and the sex, the biology, the, the body, the reproductivity, that whole kind of earthy sense of physical power tends to be uh, pushed to the periphery. Um, so the body that we were finding in these big licentious yaka dances was, I, I realized writing that article, closer to the Rabelaisian person. It was an open ambivalent body whose jokes were, as, as uh, Bakhtin says, particles of an immense whole, of the popular carnival spirit of the world that laughs. I argued that the body normative, normatively at work in Yaka ethnography had a kinship with the body that only occasionally breaks through the moral veil of hierarchical culture, where Bourdieu emphasizes that male domination tends to restrict women's verbal consciousness. Uh, their discourse is dominated by the male values of virility, so any reference to specifically female sexual interests is excluded. You had here this very clearly unrestricted verbal consciousness of Mbengele or Bayaka women's physical presence. Um, and that collective female body with its contradictory signaling power was vibrantly, publicly pushing back at every opportunity with its own physical, visceral language to do with contact and reproductive solidarity and sensuality. Um, and the, I came to the conclusion that this was the language of a kind of love that we don't often get to see in our public culture anymore, dominated as it is by the romantic dyad um, and you know by the, the focus on um, the, the priorities to, that are to do really with the male collective body, territory, virility, uh, conquest. Uh, the, this kind of big Mbengele body was speaking to or about a corresponding principle whose urge was to break off or close and yet as long as the two groups remained in dialogue balance was maintained so um, I don't know if that's clear what I what I was trying to bring out is that um, in cultures where the male body has a strong collective presence and I think so much really does come at origin out of the, the uh, out of the, the the early kind of deep history of, of um, the body that without 
a corresponding female collective asserting the priorities of that collective female body, you have a, an immediate loss of balance and an immediate kind of um, freezing of the power pendulum. Uh, it, it's not I'm focusing here on women's collective uh, expressions of power. Of course, among the Benjeli men have an equally strong uh, collective coalitionary voice that they are, they're continually asserting as well. Um, but you need both in order for the moral community to remain plain and in order for power to be able to circulate through the entire society you just have to have both these strong collective bodies and that comes out uh, really well in Marilyn Strathern's work on the Melanesian male collective body uh, asserting dominance continually over, um, over individual women. Um, so what I was trying to assemble using uh, the work of Colin Turnbull, Michelle Kisluk and Jerome Lewis's wonderful ethnography on the M. Benjeli was the speaking body at the pivot of this power pendulum. This was the body that had to be repressed by orders where hierarchy is the dominant principle. But as Bakhtin had argued, if you take away the static ideology of hierarchy, it's like lifting a wedge out of something that's been blocked. Uh, the body kind of starts to laugh and things start to get interesting and the pendulum starts to move back and forth again. And what's striking, reading Bakhtin's writing on the world of carnival and this laughing body animated by strings of abuse and body jokes is the parallel with so much of the data on hunter-gatherer ritual life. So I found his work then and I still find it very important in thinking through the political nature of Yaka women's social collectives with this spotlight on procreative sex and corporeal power generally. Um, and it's important too, Bakhtin's work is quite important in setting into our political terms the repercussions of the loss of that collective maternal body from the cultural field. The body that once offered such a kind of joyful counter to, um, to male dominance. Uh, the, the Eros paper was describing this literal and metaphorical dance, this, this politics rooted in motion. Um, and I, I argued that public ritual performances among the Benjeli or the Bayaka or the Mbuti were operating as a powerful body statement on behalf of egalitarian reality. The ex these exchanges were a means of creating society. They weren't one of society's tools. They weren't just a nice offshoot of something else. The conversation they ignited between the sexes was the structure of social life itself, which suggests that antagonism is explored as part of a cultural conversation that's necessary and positive. You, so you kind of would have, would have tension being continually juggled as a creative force. In obedience-oriented cultures, um, it's normal to attempt to resolve social antagonism from an ethical moral stance formed in the belief about dualism, not as a conversation, but as a permanently closed door. But resolution in such contexts is potentially the point at which dialogic freezes, motion stops and hierarchy floods the interpersonal field. Um, so the politics of Eros was trying to bring out that somatic conversation that was being maintained between the sexes. Uh, and of course the political implications of that way of managing power, the way that the power field was kept plain by the work of the sexes, is enormous. So, following on from that, um, I would like to read a wee bit about um, both the Juntua Nom, the, the Juntua Substance Nom, and the Mbengele uh, term Ekila, to see what kind of body these might point to or elaborate alongside that collective ritual male and female um, coalitionary self. 
uh, and moving away from traditional ideas of morality as something planted in our heads, a set of concepts or rules or constraints agreed on and, and listed like the Ten Commandments to compel people to behave themselves. This is uh, what I'm calling corporeal morality. It's a whole other kind of uh, accountability. And I'm going to just read directly from this fantastic... Um, uh, it's, it's a follow-up really to the work of the, the two anthropologists involved here, Richard Katz and Megan Beasley. Uh, but it was designed to be accessible to, to non-specialists. So um, it's called Healing Makes Our Hearts Happy. And, and here they're talking about nom, this substance nom that permeates all of Juntois life, particularly the, the, um, the dances, the healing dances. Some anthropologists have translated nom as medicine, but it is more than just medicine. Nom is energy, spiritual energy. There are many references for nom, and the limits to these references are purposely ambiguous. Things of power, including things out of the ordinary, like herbal medicines, African sorcery, menstrual blood, the vapor trail of a jet, are among the contexts in which the word nom is used. We were constantly frustrated in any attempt to pin down its meaning. Juntois people say nom is a thing unto itself. But in whatever form or function, nom is felt as strong, and the word nom itself carries the power of nom. Nom is invisible, though it can be seen and picked up by experienced healers during a state of enhanced awareness. It's located only by its existence in a particular form. Whether it be a person, a song, um, nom isn't personalized nor personified. Nobody can possess it exclusively nor control it completely. This primary force in the Juntois world universe of experience is at its strongest in the healing dance. It resides in the dance fire, in the healing songs, and most of all in the bodies of the healers, concentrated in the pit of their stomachs and the base of their spines. The dance activates the nom in the healers. Their singing and their dance movements, they say, heat up the nom. When it boils, it vaporizes and rises up the spine. And uh, they quote um, one of the, the healers as saying, it hurts. It's like fire, it burns you. As Nom reaches the base of the healer's skull, they enter a state of transcendence. Once in this state, the dancer can heal. Often translated as trance, it's actually a state of enhanced awareness in which healers can travel physically and psychically over great distances. But laughter is never far away. The same strict Western distinction between the sacred and profane doesn't exist for the Juntoisi. The dance is their most intensely spiritual event, but during it they exchange some of their spiciest jokes and tease each other with friendly vigor about their dancing. It doesn't have an atmosphere of solemn piety, though the sense of awe is profound. We do this, says Nisa, when our hearts are happy. Um, and you know it's such a beautiful description you could really go on and on um, but e essentially this this force that is uh, very strongly rooted in the the gut area of the body is um, a, a kind of synergistic uh, force. It's diffused out through the community and brought back into the bodies of the healers continually. You can't control it, you can't own it. Uh, nobody fully can sum it up uh, or, or even really fully understand it because it's one of these um, slippery kind of elemental, uh, almost body concepts. That, that nobody can claim they're they're located very strongly in the in the, um, actually in in the, the uterus area of the body, um, and it's interesting because the the Juntois say that women during their reproductive years have to curb their dancing because their natural nom from puberty onwards is so. Uh, 
so so hot so powerful that if they were to dance as well they, they might kind of overflow um, with this this power this heat or, or visceral quality and so they tend uh, although there, there are um, older women healers who are, are very very um, much respected and, and do a lot of dancing and healing women in their reproductive years tend to sing their their part in raising the the heat or the numb is to contribute to singing and the singing is uh, as visceral and as as um, tangible as the numb is they say it's like a it's like a physical quality when you can't touch the the song when you can't feel it in the air the healers can't heal so they're they're uh, profoundly connected um, so uh, you can spoil your numb um, by refusing to share it or by um, trying to, to hoard dances um, that that's that's people say that that kind of will will spoil a healer it, 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 it he won't be, he won't be able to work as effectively people won't trust him in the same way so you have on one hand this very powerful um, physical quality located in the body that's being used through dances to heal the community but on the other hand you can't privatize it you can't own it um, and it it took me around to thinking about Jerome Lewis's writing on uh, the Mbengele term Aquila and uh, Jerome has a, a brilliant paper on Aquila um, where he he's it, he's talking about how central it is to Mbengele thinking the world um, and how physically rooted it is but again how it's owned and shared by the entire community it's not something that anybody can ever claim for themselves so so now I'm gonna just read a, 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 f a paragraph from from him on Aquila he says it defines how the body's vital forces reproductive potential productive activities and their products moral and personal qualities and emotions should be shared so as to ensure that group members experience good health unproblematic childbirth and child rearing and successful hunting and gathering from an M. Bengeli perspective these are the basic components of a good life Although Aquila contributes to the mechanics of a non-explicit egalitarianism, at its most fundamental level, it serves to organize gender roles by defining them as primordial, as bound to bodies and bound to biological processes. Aquila establishes hunting and childbirth as prototypical activities, defining people as men and women, and weaves these roles together in a complex set of interrelationships. The language of cutting and tying is used to elaborate this. Aquila addresses cutting in its discourse on proper sharing and keeping things apart, but simultaneously Aquila ties many things together. Smells, gender roles, married couples, sexual politics, cosmology, and egalitarianism as a political, moral, and economic orientation. So you can see in both the Juntois data and in Jerome's writing, the way in which, in contrast to thought commitments and responsibilities, corporeal morality is premised on contact. It's, it's premised on, in the NOM case, literally, of the, the, the contact of people during the healing dance. Um, women, when they're singing to, to, to raise the NOM, are just, you know, wrapped around each other like a, like a loop and, and the singing comes out of that woven body quality uh, and, and the, the, the physical uh, element of the healing is, is primary. And with Aquila, the, the contact is being made between uh, men and women's activities, men and women's bodies, men, male and female power, game spirits and menstrual blood. Uh, it, it, people are being connected by this kind of constantly moving uh, polysemic <coughs> term uh, as it roots down into, into bodies. In the egalitarian habitus, 
the, the continuity of the person from birth onwards with this larger sociokinetic body guarantees that felt morality in which one's able to connect by having experienced the other. And that's, that's what I'm arguing. So, uh, you know, I, I think for a long time um, I thought of morality as something, having been raised an Irish Catholic, to dread, you know, you, you really just, it was like, um, yeah, it, it was a scary word because it was being imposed on you and it was Puritan and oppressive. Um, but my understanding of it is completely changing through understanding what a, a live moral community is. Um, real morality is painful and it's empowering at the same time. It's less about abstract rights and wrongs than issues of trust and respect. It's somatic. It registers concretely. It affects the gut, the stomach, the lungs, the heart. I, I think when you're feeling for someone, when you're caring about someone, it always registers immediately in the body. It's not that you think, oh, you know, I'm so sad for her, I'm so hurt for him. It's, it's in your stomach, it's in your lungs, it's, it's a visceral uh, experience of the other. Uh, this is what Sarah Hurdy, the biological anthropologist, argues was the great achievement of uh, early modern, uh, the, the, the um, ancestors of early modern humans was this kind of emotional modernity, this ability to, to be connected to other people and an interest in how they're feeling. Um, and I think that that kind of morality, that kind of moral responsibility um, that's emotional and visceral uh, and, and, and contains this desire to be similarly known and felt for, um, as Hurdy argues, would have underlain all subsequent cultural and linguistic developments. So when you put that beside the kind of Irish Catholic morality I grew up with, static, disembodied morality, um, it's the, 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 the hierarchical morality, the static morality is dead. It's, it's no longer within the experience of the body, and so it has to be imposed from the outside and against the will. It's, it has lost its living quality because people aren't experiencing it and they're not passing it on to their kids in the same way. Um, Hunter-gatherers like the Mbengele offer this striking contrast in their privileging of motion over stasis, sharing over privatization, contact and physical, uh, th this physical contact f um, over control and, and there's a huge emphasis on that from birth onwards that children are not only held uh, by a huge amount of, of different people, they'll, they'll, they're also co-fed, so babies are being breastfed by whoever happens to have milk at, at any given time. There's the extending of the, the, the baby and the child's body out into this collective body that isn't literal, it's not just metaphorical, it's physical. You know, when you're sharing milk, when you're sharing sweat, when you're sharing the energetic labour of holding and soothing other people's kids, the, 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 the whole possibilities for the body are extended away out beyond on this little individual ego that we are very good at living with, or maybe not so good at living with. <laughs> um, so both the Mbengele and Juntois refer to an embodied source of power or heat located in the gut area, cultivated through these cultural and ritual practices. This core power that's expressed for the community through spirit or healing dances that flows out of and into the person simultaneously. Akila and Nam belong to individuals, but they're inseparable from the collective body, which brings to mind things like the Buddhist concept of the Hara or vital center, which is also located around the, the gut area. A lot of cultures have that, actually, the, the idea of this um, core kind of um, power, a body power that's, that's um, not so developed there, but um, you, can, you can find it. 
Um, so to me this is corporeal morality. It's kind of like the biochemistry of, of the community. Its heat, its velocity is stored in individuals using the cultural containers of Ikila and Nom. And you can feel in the data on Nom this immense power of um, how to be generous. Um, how you can be generous whenever uh, the source of social and political power, uh, not to mention spiritual power and energy, is located in your own body and cultivated in your own body from birth onwards. You have this idea of generosity uh, as power and stinginess as weakness, uh, as um, caring and sharing as having this uh, powerful kind of gracefulness in it where hoarding and withholding have a brittle small quality so that the scarcity mentality that defines so much of um, uh, modern society um, it, uh, modern hierarchical society comes to seem very small beside this uh, opening out generous quality that's cultivated through Nom and Aquila, which comes back again to Eros and the flow quality embedded in that concept, this carnivalesque kind of bendiness or openness. Um, that goes beyond the individual personality. And the Mbengele seem to be cultivating this personal poise or earthed element hand in hand with dynamism and fluidity. The responsibility for controlling power is centered in the gut and the solar plex plexus area of every individual so that people are able to experience the, the wider kind of spillage of the, that big spiritual power that the Juntois talk about when they talk about Nom. You can only experience that by being um, rooted into the communal body. And, and that again is, uh, comes back to the, the idea of a politics of Eros. So for me, uh, hunter-gatherers like the Mbengele turn Cartesian dictates on their head by suggesting that it's the removal of the self to a small area around the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, i.e. the rational analytical brain, which leads to all subsequent dissociation and anime and failure to manifest fully in the world. And uh, in fact, there's a great um, uh, writer on social trauma, Van der Kolk, um, uh, who, who has a groundbreaking study of trauma in society called The Body Keeps the Score. And he suggests that it, it's knowing nothing about the anthropological literature, that it's only via a return to the sensory world. It's only via a return to body intelligence um, and the reunification of uh, things like the sympathetic nervous system with the emotional brain, with the center of self-awareness, the medial prefrontal cortex. It's, it's, it's linking up all these parts of the, the flow within the body that will allow people to experience themselves as connected and alive. And, and he uses a lot of um, things like dance, uh, breath, uh, yoga, as ways to try to bring people who've been highly traumatized, either as children or, or, or later, back down into the body. For him, it's all about rooting in that vital center, which is exactly what people like the Mbengeli are recognizing from birth, that to be a complete person, you need to be able to access that, uh, that, that physical, sexual uh, root that becomes the foundation for women's coalitionary voice. Um, so these kinds of egalitarian social systems are offering a striking contrast to hierarchy and they're privileging of this kind of sensuous tactile flow um, and I've argued that their um, expertise is in virtual structure where social power is shared by being continually circulated around the community. Um, uh, and here we can see two powerful mechanisms for doing that um, in Nom and Aquila respectively. By keeping the experience of the body public, they epitomize Bakhtin's, the great generic body of the people, this intensely political moving force that sort of breathes sociality. 
Um, egalitarian systems are striking in their physical respect for children, as I've said, and for the way in which infants are community, communally parented. Everything's pooled. Um, and I was thinking about this, um, thinking about the, the, the literature on coalitionary ritual um, and thinking about the, the ethnography on the likes of the Mbengele with these qualities, these kind of s more slippery, deeper qualities of Nom and Aquila that are the energy of egalitarianism really. And, and, and I was thinking about the relationship with children and the fact that, you know, just as we know we make our children, but they also make us. Um, just as they learn contact from us or not, we learn it from them. They teach us how to touch, how to hold, how to nurture this vital life energy in the human, how to be tender, how to be generous, not only with resources and time and energy, but, but literally with our own bodies. Um, uh, and, and I also thought that children were their cult culturally central um, and held at the crux of that collective social body uh, are a big force in teaching, uh, in, in keeping going the, the play element. You know, how to be loopy and irreverent and jumpy and so many of the things that we as a culture spend our entire time trying to drum out of them. Um, so I thought, is it any wonder they're kind of, you know, siphoned off uh, from the rest of society? Um, because they're dangerous to the male collective body in isolation from its female counterpart. They're, they're dangerous to the male collective body uh, separated from its paternal um, it's, it's, it's paternal part in this dialogue that goes on between maternal, paternal and, and children. Um, and among the Mbengeli or the Juntois, they approach puberty, puberty held at the crux of the social body. Young people are actually being encouraged to engage in practices that will cultivate the substance located in their solar plexus area and connected through all these webs of relationship, meaning and metaphor to the vitality of the larger body. They're encouraged to cultivate the root of their own moral capacity through fostering ritual and social connections to everything and everyone around them. So they're, they're actively involved in the weaving of their own bodies into this molecular system. What are we cultivating? Uh, what are they cultivating when they cultivate Ekila or Nom? Um, what what are, are we trying to cultivate when we talk about things like the Hara? It's basically responsibility to the communal body. Um, accountability to all the other bodies of which we are part and on which we depend. Um, and I don't think it's a surprise that men particularly have been encouraged to ritually cultivate uh, this quality, uh, Akila or Nom. Um, like I said earlier, the Juntoise women's Nom automatically flares up at puberty and remains volatile for the rest of their cycling life. So this is an element women automatically, by virtue of their cycling reproductive body, are believed to have access to. Um, uh, the focus for, for male healers in Nome or for um, Imbangele men who are really trying to build up strong Aquila is in being able to share uh, everything that you have with your community. That, that increases and strengthens your Aquila or your Nom. Being able to observe the communal principles through your own physical conduct in the world. So not only are they offering access to a moral universe, they're also a kind of constant cautioning that if you want this this beautiful heat or energy that everyone um, cherishes, you need to uh, be able to adhere to shared principles, shared egalitarian principles. Using the insights of Sarah Hardy into the emergence of emotional modernity among cooperative breeders, I suggested that what lies at the heart of this live molecular system uh, isn't 
um, as a lot of uh, recent writing on uh, egalitarianism, the evolution of egalitarianism suggest warfare or intramale exchange networks or necessarily even sex but uh, babies and children and uh, the coalitionary muscle that evolved to protect them and to keep them culturally central. Um, I asked what connects cognitive and emotional intelligence and the answer seems to be everywhere to do with this articulate, socially responsible and inherently joyful common body. By this measure the kinds of hierarchical capitalist gerontocracies that we now see dominating globally based on male collective imperatives, territory, virility, quantity over quality working directly against the survival needs of children and the rest of us are fundamentally immoral. So anthropology is perfectly placed to examine and describe the egalitarian alternative, organic corporeal morality.